The King George V class. And I'm not talking about the 1939 variety. This is the 1911 ones. 13 and a half inch guns. Roaring firepower. For the time. But more importantly... They are the first class launched after the Orions, in terms of British construction. They are what cement the next generation of British ships. I've talked before that the only way you can make Dreadnought more British is 13 and a half inch guns. Because so often that the British, when they are looking for their ideal gun, in terms of battleships, do they go for the 13 and a half inch? In so many other periods, you know, the 13 and a half inch is the one they really look forward to. And it becomes the sort of. The ships with those guns, they are the core of the fighting force. And this is true for the Royal Navy of World War I for the Grand Fleet. The Orions, the King George V's, and the Iron Dukes. They are all 13 and a half inch gun ships. They're often overlooked when we start talking about things because, let's be honest, the others, well, they're sexier. The Queen Elizabeth's have 15 inch guns. They're designed to be faster. They are reaching for being a fast battleship, and if the industrialists hadn't persuaded the government that the small tube boilers weren't available, then they could have actually achieved it. Or at least achieved something approximate to it. Far closer than they got. But the Orions, the King George V's, the Iron Dukes, Those 12 ships. They had a backbone. Well, they were to be the backbone. Let's be honest, all 12 of them were to be the backbone of the Grand Fleet. Unfortunately, well, Audacious had her issues. And sadly is sunk and lost. But the other 11. The other 11. Only Emperor of India would miss Jutland. The Royal Navy built 12. One is lost. One. Well. Let's be honest, if you have that many ships in the service, the fact that one is off in, in maintenance, routine servicing, is hardly surprising. But these ships, they are the backbone of the Royal Navy at Jutland. Their 13 and a half inch guns are well worn in, their crews well trained and drilled. Everything has had time to mature. And that's important, things maturing. You see, one of the things that's often forgotten, often put to one side, when we're talking about ships, is how they grow in experience. A brand new ship is probably the weakest the ship will ever be, because everyone's getting used to its peculiarities, its specialties, its individuality, and a ship does have individuality. And the longer they serve, the more crews build up that sort of institutional memory, that culture, that understanding that works with it to get the best out of the ship and out of themselves. The King George V's are powerful. Show book luck. But they're powerful more because of when they are launched and completed. 
They are launched 1911-1912. They are completed in no November 1912 in case of Jing George V, but in May, March, and August 1913 for Centurion Ajax on Audacious. As they were completed, they are capable, but they were potential, not reality. See, ship in terms of effectiveness gets more and more capable as time goes on. But in terms of its value and capability as far as a nation that owns it is concerned, there is actually a peak and a fall. Why? Because newer ships and newer systems come online that can't be included into the older ship. And those are valuable. But the point is, the crew still needs to mature them. So for a while, usually when this ship's at its peak, let's say, the older ship's at its peak, they're starting. And they do that. And you try, especially when you have a large enough fleet, to always make sure there is a flow going on in terms of your ships coming in. So why can I say when at, when it's launched, when they are launched in 1911, 1912, when they're completed and commissioned in 1912, 1913, why am I saying they are the most powerful ships or the most useful ships at Jutland? Well, think about it. The crews have had three years to build up their knowledge, their understanding of these ships. And in that time, they haven't really been knocked down. They are still as modern as you really can get. Yes, there are newer, bigger, more powerful ships in service. Yes. But those ships are brand new in service, and they are developing. You consider again the case of Jutland, well, HMS Royal Sovereign was left behind due to crew inexperience. Resolution was, uh, was fitting out. And Ramleys had not even been launched. HMS Queen Elizabeth herself had just returned from Dardanelles and was in refit. So four of the 15-inch gun ships, four of the newest ships, are not available. One of them because of crew inexperience. And yet, there's only one of these ships of the 13 and a half inch gun ships. Not available. One has been lost. Audacious has been lost. But one is not available. And that's not due to crew inexperience. That's due to service and maintenance. I have to say the fate of HMS Royal Sovereign. Well, that's what gets me into debate sometimes with people over Jutland. When they go, oh yes, it was necessary to bring the battle cruisers into the battle line because they needed the extra firepower. They needed all the firepower they could get. If that's the case, then why is Royal Sovereign left behind? Why leave behind a 15-inch gun battleship if you are that worried about the firepower? And the answer is, they weren't. The answer is, there were many issues and reasons as to why the battle cruisers ended up in the battle line. Mostly, it's due to having somewhere to put them, coordinating a large fleet, and the personalities of those involved. Not necessarily due to their necessity. And certainly not due to their viability of being in that line. One of the things you have to see with these ships is you cannot get a more archetypal dreadnought than the King George V's. 
literally, they look as... If you ask young people who know about naval affairs to draw a dreadnought battleship, the ship they draw tends to turn up looking like King George V and her class. You could argue it's the Orions, but let's be honest, the King George Vs are just that bit bigger than the Orions. Just that bit bigger than the Orions. The Orions... well... Their displacement is 22,274 tons in normal. Uh, King George V's is 25,830 tons in normal. Yeah. Just a little bit bigger. Roughly three and a half thousand tons bigger. The Orions are called the first super dreadnoughts because they have 13 half inch guns and that's what they were calling the ships with the new big guns. The reason the Orions in don't catch on as being called super dreadnoughts is because the next class after them has the same guns, but is 3,000 tons bigger. 3,500 tons bigger. It's very hard to call something, this is the new Super Dreadnought, and yep. What's next? Well, they're going to be even bigger. So they're the Super Duper Dreadnought? No, we're not calling them that. It's one of the things for the Queen Elizabeths. They get to be called Super Dreadnoughts because what comes after them? The R's. The British have done the quality, they're now doing the quantity. <sighs> it works, but still. What is also interesting, of course, is that the Orions, the King George V's, the Iron Dukes, they're all ordered as batches of four. They're all four ships. And then the Queen Elizabeth come along. They have five ships. And then the R-Class comes along. They are eight ships ordered. Why the change? Well, Britain could have been ordering more from the get-go. But they wanted to finish off the naval race, the Anglo-German naval race. They did that with the Queen Elizabeth. You could argue they did that with the Iron Dukes, but they did that with the Queen Elizabeths. They raised the cost of building the Dreadnought high enough. It would cause political fury within Germany and issues with debates between the army, those po the political side that supported the army, and those that supported the navy. They then raised even more when they ordered 8 R-Class. At that point... What can you do? And then they order a sixth Queen Elizabeth as well. It's just... You've been ordering in batches of four. Now you're ordering six and eight? What happened? So let's consider the particulars of this class, because they are a good-looking class. And you notice that they included Orion's there as well, because they have the same outline. But the differences between the Orions and the King George V's is that the King George V's are scaled up. Basically, someone took the Orions and went, you know what, we can do better. The Orions went, but what are super ships? And they are superly good. But the King George V's are better in every single way, just a little bit. They have, well, five meters more length overall. They are 20 centimeters beamier. They have a draft which is, believe it or not, 0.8 meters shallower. They both have 18 water tube boilers and both theoretically have 27,000 shaft horsepower. With both of them 
having four shafts driven by two steam turbine sets, and both of them theoretically having a top speed of 21 knots, but I would take that with a pinch of salt. The range of the King George V class was 6,310 nautical miles at 10 knots, versus the range of the Orions, which was 6,730 nautical miles at 10 knots. Theoretically, therefore, the Orions had 400 nautical miles more range. The Orions would carry between 738 and 1,100 crew. The King George V's, 860 to 1,100. Both had five twin 13.5-inch guns. Both had 16 4-inch guns in their single case mode and mounts. And both had three 21-inch torpedo tubes. But the King George V's had a continuous 12-inch belt, whereas the Orion's was between 8 and 12 inches. Deck for both was between 1 and 4 inches in thickness. Turrets were 11 inch thickness. The barbettes on the King George V's were 10 inches, whereas on the Orion's they're between 4 and 10. The bulkheads were 6 to 10 inches on both. And then conning tower is 11 inches on both. They are powerful, powerful ships. But as said, in every single way, the Orions are just not quite as good as the King George V's. And it's again, it's a problem if you make a super dreadnought. It can't be overshadowed by the very next class if you're going to call it the super dreadnought. It just can't be. It just will lose all its cachet with the press before it's even launched. Because, again, if we consider the Orions, they are launched in August 1910, March 1911, May 1911, February 1911. So, last one's launched in May 1911. First, the King George V is launched in October 1911. That's HMS King George V herself. You can't be a super dreadnought. And then, eight months down the line, someone goes, well, you know, we built this. All these ships was designed around their big guns, even more so than HMS Dreadnought herself, because lessons had been learned, and this is one of the reasons why they are built the way they are built, why they are the way they are. To give those guns the range in terms of motion they needed. There is a lot of work put into trying to make these ships as stable as possible. It has... variable effects. Okay, again, the yards chosen to build them are not bad yards. We've seen this in some of the German ships. This is dockyards, Portsmouth and Devonport, uh, you know, Royal Navy dockyards, Camel Lairds for Audacious, and Ajax is built by Scots in Greenock. None of these are bad yards. All of them are actually pretty darn solid. Yet, whilst they worked their best to improve stability, to make them better gun firing platforms, they actually didn't succeed as well as they would with the King with the Iron Dukes, which would come next. And a lot of the credit we can give to the Queen Elizabeth class in terms of their stability as gun platforms compared to some of the earlier dreadnoughts, in terms of the improvements that are made. This is one of those things. 
people, when you start talking to those people, go, well, they weren't bad sailing ships, they weren't that unstable. No, they're not. But when you're talking about long-range gunnery, when you're talking about long-range gunnery, the mo uh, change in the motion from to that, just slowing down the, stabi the instability of the ship, can make a massive difference in terms of accuracy. Because you do have to calculate to extent on the movement of the ship when you're firing. Because there's the angle you elevate the gun to, and there's the angle the gun will be fired at due to the ship's motion. And again, if we're talking uh, you are firing at maximum range, half a degree extra can uh, cause a wildly different spread of your shells. Doesn't take much. It's like modern sports, when we're talking about the difference between the absolute best of the Premier League football players and or soccer players, whatever you want to call it, football is what we call it in the UK, and the football players who are just in the Premier League. The differences in actual performance and actual capabilities are minuscule, but those minuscule differences build up to pre uh, present and project a completely different caliber of player than the other. The Royal Navy is always trying to deal with being in both a qualitative and a quantitative race. The quantitative race is, of course, against the Germans and their naval laws and all their ideas for their risk fleet strategy. The qualitative race, of course, is America, it's Japan, it's Italy. But at the same point, the Royal Navy has to be true to itself. And I don't mean this in an RT. I've got to be true to myself. I can only have Mars ice cream because Ben and Jerry's is just not me. I'm talking about being true to itself in terms of what does it need ships to do? What does it need warships for? That's a big factor in why they're being procured after all. What do they need those warships to do? And it's something to an extent they almost lose sight of. At certain points in the naval race, they are literally building, just for the sake of building. With the King George V especially, they come back to this idea of going, hang on, we need ships which are going to be able to be our fleet ships where we need them to be. King George V's were designed with that. They were designed with the idea of where do we need where could we need to deploy these ships? Where else will they could they be needed? What could they be used for? Those are all questions which you have to think. And it's also one of the reasons why they do grow. Why they are bigger than the Orions. Because the Orions are built to be the next stage. The next step in the Dreadnought battleship race. And the King George V's are built to be, hang on, we need actually something which is going to work for us as a battleship in our needs. And... Again, you can argue that they continue with this idea when we're talking through the Iron Dukes, the Queen Elizabeth. But then when you get to the R's, 
Well, there is, to an extent, a we need to have build eight 15-inch gun ships. We need them as quickly as possible. Going on. And pictures... Pictures like this, that show their lines. And this. Show exactly what I mean when I'm talking about a ship being built for the wider role of the Royal Navy. These thing, these ships are impressive-looking ships. All dreadnoughts, to an extent, capital ships are going to be impressive-looking ships because they have to be. They're special enough. But even by the dreadnought standards of already having to be a, of being a certain level of impressiveness, these are impressive-looking ships. Effort has been placed into their proportions, into their shaping, into their overall lines to make sure they are as effective ambassadors for Britain as possible. It's important. These are the ships which post-war are being sent around the world. Yes, I've already mentioned, hopefully, that they are the ships which are saved until Nelson and Rodney enter service, that they take part in the Sharnak incident, that they are sent to deal with the uh, Russian Civil War, serving as part of the Mediterranean fleet officially, Unofficially spending a lot of time in the Black Sea. There were debates, though, about getting rid of these ships. There were several Navy who were not as keen on getting rid of their reliable war horses, as you might presume. Especially not when you're replacing them with just two new ships. The King George V's were good for the presence missions, were good for the global operations. One of the interesting things when you consider the Royal Navy of the Treaty Era, and you actually look at the capital ships, you start to realize one of the reasons why the battle cruisers, especially Renown, Repulse, and to an extent Hood, are deployed around the world so often is not just showing the world they can be deployed around the world, but what other options does the Royal Navy really have for global deployments? The Queen Elizabeths are far too valuable to be broken up so and sending around. There aren't really times of enough peace for them to be wanting to do that. And... Nelson and Rodney, they're powerful statements. They're of great value, but they're also incredibly important to the Royal Navy and one of them being caught on their own in the beginning of a conflict is probably the Royal Navy's nightmare scenario as far as their capital ships are concerned. One being caught on its own by a significant squadron of enemy ships enough that no matter how good account it gives itself it gets lost. The King George V's were good-looking ships. The Royal Navy was, to an extent, less worried if they lost one, because it wasn't as much of an effect on the, on the balance sheet. And they were good at presence missions. They had a lot of space. And there were things looked into for them. You know, could they have their guns upgraded? Would they have to lose a specific turret? The treaties had come through, though. The treaties had said they had to be replaced. And these ships were most often not going in and out or just sitting in reserve. Again, they're there for if a war happens. They're there for if a deployment happens. But other ships are in use. So yes, they are the options to replace.
but it's still a thing to lose them. Speaking of oh, Year of Technology, I forget when this video is coming out. It's going to be out on the 10th of September, so that's good. That means we've got the Holzendorf and Unrestricted Submarine Warfare coming up. Ooh. That'll be fun. That's it. That's hopefully going to be a good video. I've put a fair amount of research into it, so I hope it's going to be a good video. But this is their last role. This is HMS Centurion. When she's been configured to be a target ship. Later on, she's converted, but as she is, she's useful. As a te uh, vessel to test being fired at, well, there you go. That's them blasting away at her, testing their gunnery. Testing their abilities on her. And she actually replaced HMS Agamemnon, which of course had been one of the Lord Nelson pre-Dreadnought ship, pre-Dreadnought battleships, in the role. She was even used in trials with dive bombers in 1933, where they achieved 19 hits out of 48. A test which had been set up by Admiral Henderson as First Sea Lord to make the case for dive bombing in the fleet era. However, her most famous role is not the one where she was getting blasted at. Her most famous role in World War II was her going around pretending to be HMS Anson. Yes, they took a ship which had been made to look like this, and through the magic of a lot of woodwork, they turned it into a King George V. So they turned a King George V into a King George V. Which, always to me, has a nice symmetry. Something appropriate. She's eventually, along with all sorts of cannon and other things which have been attached to her, sunk as a breakwater off Omaha Beach in June 1944. So, she fights in Jutland. She fight well. She fights in Jutland. She fights in the World War One. In World War One, she fights in. World War Two. She fights her whole way through the 1930s because she's used a target ship. She sees more action than anyone else, let's be honest, in the 1930s. She's always getting shot at by her own navy. And in World War Two, she goes around pretending to be a new generation King George V to distract the Germans and everyone else about where the British are. The King George V's are key ships, not because of any stats. Not because of really any big deeds, although they do a lot of little things that add up. It's because they are in many ways a return to the ideas of what a battleship needs to be for things other than providing the status of a battleship. Or a Royal Navy. They're important because of that. And because of how it affects the designs coming after them that take their cue from the King George of it. 
So. There are some really good questions which could come from this. There are lots of ideas considered about the King George V and what could be done with them. Even some kind of naughty ideas were of course considered on how to maybe keep them around. Well, here is the question for you. And I'd like to hear your view on it. Let's say instead of requiring their immediate dismissal, the treaty system included an overage category for battleships, capital ships, like they did for cruisers. Ergo, if ships are X years old, or are built prior to this point, let's say, have been launched before January the 1st, 1914, they are considered overage and therefore of no naval value, so we don't care about them on your strength. Thinking about the ships which would therefore would have survived, till World War II, perhaps, if nations have been repaired to pay the bill for them to maintain them, probably in reserve. Do you think that would have been useful? And if so, what do you think they might have done? What do you think they might have been able to do? I think it'd be interesting. And it was... Not an unconsidered idea. They didn't go with it because obvious reasons. They wanted a massive cost saving for everyone, basically, in reducing the number of battle, the capital ships around, as they were calling them, combining battleships and battle cruisers into the same category. But speaking of that, there is actually a question in this month's patron. Patron vote, uh, suggestions suggested by patrons, and it's currently for undergoing vote on Patreon at the moment. So patrons, please go and vote for um, various ideas on the treaty and on capital ships in World War Two and the different options. In fact, I would have to say this month has been a really heavy, alternate history, alternate future, question mark. Usually it's slightly more 50-50. This month it's been, it's, it's more like 60-40. And some interesting questions. Some really interesting questions. There are some questions which I honestly did consider maybe not putting through because I was worried I would I get them done in time. And I thought, well, theoretically I should be able to. It's going to be tight, but theoretically I should be able to. We'll see. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Take care. From one Ajax to another.